team presentation skills. One of the skills that was taught to us to deal with nerves when you're presenting is to imagine the audience naked. And that's supposed to make you less nervous. But as a young trainee attending the Circular Research Society, I think I might have got the instructions wrong. And, and I do remember in the early 1980s sitting in the auditorium, and as the nerves got worse and worse and the peripheral vision began to close in, this bespectacled gentleman sitting in the front row intently listening to every word that you said and writing notes throughout. And that, of course, was Hugh Dudley. And Hugh Dudley was feared at meetings because for a surgical trainee, as you've heard, he was the doyen of academic British surgery. There wasn't a textbook that a young surgeon had in their bookcase or got out from the library that hadn't been either authored or edited by Hugh Dudley. And amongst those textbooks was the little one on the right-hand side, which is his textbook on presentation. And it's very interesting to look back at this textbook from, 1990s, from 1977. My copy has this in the front page, but I do assure you it was acquired by honest means and this has to be written on for your life. Um, so I'm going to quote a little bit from that textbook, but um, to summarize, I guess, what Dudley brought to, to surgery throughout the world, not, ju not just in the UK, this is from Monash, where you, if you've heard, he was the foundation professor of surgery. And I think that quotation about him summarizes very much how he approached surgery and surgical teaching. Of course, many of you know much better, uh, would have a better experience of this time here in St. Mary's, but it was during that time that he came to Belfast, where I was a young registrar, struggling to measure blood flow in the peripheries of patients with diabetes. And in his inimitable way, he told me my research was a complete load of codswallop, that I should abandon it and go and find myself a decent basic physiologist, which I did in the, in the person of Judith Allen, who was a wonderful senior lecturer in physiology, and we developed a plethysmograph graph for measuring digital blood flow, and a, an MD thesis ensued. So I am forever grateful to Hugh Dudley, and I'm very grateful to be invited here to give this talk. And, the, and your theme, artificial intelligence and imaging and surgery, fits perfectly for my title, which I hope would have brought a wry smile to his face. So PowerPoint presentations, artificial, unintelligent, and lacking imagination. So why that choice of title? Well, artificial, because when we communicate about patients at the bedside, this is how we do it. We talk to each other. We have the information at hand, and we have the patient at hand. And when we move into the symposium room for an audit meeting or an m and meeting, we do it like this. And that's nothing like how we present cases to each other. And you're already starting to read down this slide, don't. There's nothing of any relevance there. But I could tell you this story much more engagingly than you could read it from the slide. And if I illustrated that with a CT scan showing the perforation, that would be much more interesting and informative to you again. So there are situations where you simply don't need PowerPoint. And PowerPoint is grossly overused. Why unintelligent? Because we think as educationalists that in teaching students about the history of the stethoscope that we can learn something from a great big long list like this. Beginning with the first bullet point which tells us that it's a device for listening. Well, hold on, is there anybody in the room who doesn't already know that? So we don't need that sort of information and adding a little cartoon picture of a stethoscope does not enhance the quality of the education. So the history of a stethoscope is a timeline, and it's better illustrated as a timeline that you can follow along with some visual aids to help you understand exactly what you're talking about. Now, it takes a bit of skill to construct a timeline line like that, but it's not beyond the learning of educated students and junior doctors. And lacking imagination, well, much the same reason in, in our core trainee boot camp, which we've been running for several years now, I was given the wonderful job of talking about ward rounds and how to do a ward round. And the standard way of teaching students is, again, to use something like this, with a picture of some crusty old physicians examining a chap who looks a bit like Woody Allen. <laughs> but why not do it a little bit differently? So here's the Williams Formula One team doing a two-second pit stop, and of course always with the presentation on presentation skills, the video will fail you at some point. But, but when you have a, a two-second pit stop with everybody knowing exactly what they need to do, you can use that as an introduction to how teams function. So when you show that to core trainees and ask them what went well, they say it was really quick. 
But is that actually the target of a pit stop? Is it a good idea to send the car out with three wheels on in under two seconds? No. So this is about people understanding their roles and responsibilities and preparing and practicing. And you can use a slightly different way of engaging the audience in a way that they didn't expect on what was otherwise going to be a very dull topic. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to have a number of themes. And one of my themes is that you should have themes, take home points that your audience want to remember. And the first one is simplicity. So the simpler you can make your message, the more easy it's going to be for the audience to remember and take home with them. So here's a group of trainees sitting at the, in the coffee room. <laughs> They've had a bad week. They're trying to work out what they should be putting into their PowerPoint presentations for next week. And the problem here is that if you open Word, it's kind of obvious to you Word is about typing some words into it. If you open Excel, it's pretty obvious that it wants you to put some numbers in. But when you open PowerPoint, what does it want you to do? It looks like you should be typing text in it. There's also an option to put graphs and, and images if you can work out how to put images in, but it doesn't really help you. And, and it's easy to use, but easy to use badly, and that's the problem. So most people sit down at their computer, and the first thing they do is they produce a title slide. And they do it with little thought and little imagination. And you end up with a very boring white slide with a title on it. So what should you do? Well, you should look at the literature, and this is a very soft piece of literature, but there's lots of literature in the educational <coughs> sector about this. That every year there is a website that produces the annoying PowerPoint survey. And every year it produces the same results. And every time that we run some teaching on presentation skills, the audience tell us that these are the things that really annoy them about PowerPoint. So why is it that everyone knows this, but very few people can fix it? And the answer is we don't teach them well enough. So let's go back to Hugh Dudley's book from 1977. And he had it cracked in 1977 when he was telling trainees at St. Mary's and across the world, don't try to reproduce your written publication in a PowerPoint presentation. It doesn't work. And in fact, you can take that a little bit further and say, there is not a PowerPoint presentation that works on screen that is also useful as a handout. So I don't give handouts at my presentation. It just doesn't work. So we need to think about designing a presentation in three stages. And some of you may have come across Ross Fisher from Sheffield, he's a pediatric surgeon. He talks about his P-cubed method, which is much the same concept, and he teaches it very well. So the first is to plan your content. And what Ross Fisher says is, when you get a topic to present on, the first thing you do is go for a walk with your dog. The reason for going for a walk with your dog, if you haven't got a dog, go for a walk with your wife, or go for a walk on your own, or go fishing. <laughs> um, but the idea is to distract you from the computer. So don't sit down at the computer and start typing. Begin to think, well, what exactly is this all about? Where is my audience now in terms of their skill level? Are they still riding around with stabilizers on, or have they gone a little bit further? And where do I realistically think I can get my audience to in terms of skills? Don't aim too high. Aim for where you think it's realistic and appropriate to get your audience. And that will define your learning objectives. And it's really important that you define your learning objectives, especially if you're teaching medical students. And you'll notice the little downturn at the end where it says learning objectives, because doctors teaching students always try to teach them that little bit too much and lose the students. So teach them what they need to know. And I was talking earlier on about things that we teach, and every medical student can tell you all about carcinoid syndrome, Personally, I'm a colorectal surgeon. I've seen two patients in my entire career with carcinoid syndrome. Why do we teach medical students about carcinoid syndrome? Let's teach them how to diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. That would be much more useful. So teach the learning objectives. And then ask yourself, what is the story I'm trying to tell? What are the key take-home messages from that? And stick to that plan. And don't be diverted away from that plan. So there are a number of ways you can do this. A good way that's used in, in presentation training in commercial industry is post-it notes. So stick a lot of post-it notes on the wall of your study and on each post-it note, put a little scribble with a very short note or a picture of what it is you want that slide to show. And I use the word show and not say. And then you can rearrange them, you can chuck them away, you can alter them as you want. Or an alternative is to open PowerPoint, make three slides, print a handout with three slides per page, and then close PowerPoint again. 
and then you have these little boxes that you can draw your pictures in, and you can write what you're going to say on the lines. And the idea is to separate your text that you're going to say from the visual that you're going to show, so that the visual supports your text. And that gives you a shopping list. So these are the things that you would need for your talk. So I need this CT scan and a picture of that patient, and you can go away and gather that data up. And that then allows you to sit down and do the design work. Now, the design is important, and many of you will recognize this sort of slide. And, and a number of slides in the next section have been slides given to me by trainees when I've gone to courses, and I ask them to volunteer some slides, and then I do a kind of before and after it. So what I would do with this, and it's very much a personal opinion. But this is a dental trainee, core trainee, talking about sharps injuries and dentistry. So if I analyze that site, the first thing is it's on one of those horrible PowerPoint backgrounds which I never use. Second thing is that there's a title which has no relevance at all to the slide, so we can take it away. The first bullet point is something that that audience will already know. So you don't need to put it in the slide, and you probably don't need to say it. The second bullet point is probably not true, because who has data on sharps injuries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southern America, even in many parts of Europe. So the only relevant learning point on this slide is the third bullet point. The British Association of Dental Nurses reporting that over half of their nurses sustain a sharps injury every year. And that's a scary figure. And if you want to start this presentation with a bit of impact, that's what should be on the slide. So that your audience get the message within five or 10 seconds of you putting the slide up and aren't distracted by this other stuff that's in there that has no place being on the visual. So you can tell them about the instance of sharp injuries, you can tell them about the risks of that, but you don't need to write it on the slide. Again, coming back to this theme of simplicity. And here's another thing, you don't have to fill the slide up. In fact, the more space you leave on the slide, the better. Designers call this black bit white space. It doesn't matter what color it is, it's called white space and really impactful slides will have lots of white space. So don't be afraid to put up an image with no text and nothing else on the slide. So here's a horrible slide um, that kind of summarizes everything that might be wrong with PowerPoint. And I, I can sense people's hearts clenching already if they're speaking later on today. So too much text that runs over lines is pretty horrible to look at. And of course, immediately the audience starts reading and you get what's called the redundancy effect. You're reading the slide. I'm reading the slide, and you're not actually listening to what I'm saying, and you're less likely to remember it. If you do put text on the slide, make sure it's aligned correctly, and if you start each line with a capital letter and finish with a full stop, make that consistent throughout the slide. Make sure that uh, you have a, a appropriate uh, spelling, this little wiggly red line under misspelled words, but medicine will catch you out, as you'll see in, in a slide later on and make sure that you capitalize your slides correctly. Of course, there's a huge debate amongst um, grammar experts and grammar nerds about whether or not you should capitalize words in your title, uh, and that's a very interesting subject for those of you really interested in grammar. But what you don't want is a slide like this. So here's Dr. Evan Karish, who's obviously an expert on pain management, speaking, not surprisingly, to a very empty auditorium. They've probably <laughs> slept for his talk before. And those of you who've got really good eyesight will notice that the speaker is quoting Dr. Evan Karash himself, and yet he still has to put everything he's going to say on his slide. And this is the result. So this is what Nancy Duarte, who's a presentation design expert in California, calls the document on a slide. I, I prefer a comment made by somebody recently, which was, that's a really nice handout, but why are you projecting it on the wall? And that's a really good way to think about a very wordy slide. So um, don't make slides that look like that. The temptation is to try and just shorten everything to make what Nancy Duarte calls a cue slide. And, and of course, it's called a cue slide because it's a cue for the speaker to remember what to say. But this is not a slide for the audience. This is a slide for the speaker. And you're looking for a slide that will back up what you're going to say. So every time you put a slide up, you need to ask yourself the question, is this slide to remind me what to say? Or is this slide for the audience to enhance what I'm saying? And if it's for you, take it out or change it in some way so that it's more meaningful for the audience. So this is a slide from, uh, actually I haven't given this course yet, but this is from uh, some of our leadership fellows and it's a trainee looking at strategies for change in obstetric practice. 
And it's a kind of standard PowerPoint slide that you'll see at lots and lots of meetings, and I'm quite sure we'll see many slides like this today. It doesn't take a lot of effort to change that into something that is, in effect, a bullet point slide, but it's just carefully disguised as something else. So we've got the same text there, which, in a sense, helps remind the speaker what they're going to say, but a little bit of eye candy so that you can look at it without reading down the whole thing and anticipating what's coming. So think about how you might improve your visuals. And again, this concept of constantly trying to take stuff out that doesn't need to be there. So back to the concept of simplicity. Okay, so what about tables and charts and graphs? And every scientific presentation needs these. And if you read Hugh Dudley's book from 1977, he has quite a bit to say about how you should present tables. As Jeffrey says, in the days when you had to put them onto paper yourself. So here's a standard PowerPoint table. And this is to illustrate entirely fictitious figures, in case there are any colonoscopists here who are wondering who on earth Dr. Armitage is. But this is to illustrate that Dr. Armitage is not very good at colonoscopy. But you can't find that data in this table. It's too complex. And so very often a speaker will begin by saying, I'm really sorry, this is a rather complicated table, but I'll talk you through it. And I'll illustrate where I'm trying to get to with this red box. I'm really sorry, you did have a red box. Um, which is fine. <laughs> it is, which is fine. <laughs> So I have a little algorithm that I go through for how I deal with the table. So that's the way PowerPoint sets it up. But let's first of all get rid of all that stuff in the background. We don't really need that stuff at all. And then anybody who's ever worked with in, a, in an accounts department will know that text should be left aligned and numbers should be right aligned because you can add up numbers better if they're right aligned. And no endoscopist in this world is 3.12 milligrams of endoscopy. So let's round the numbers up and down so that they're easier for the audience to interpret. And then by all means, divide the groups into meaningful groups, so by hospital here. But why not make it match the rest of the style of your presentation? Now, the next thing is how do we make our own Dr. Armitage's data stand out? And the temptation is to make it red in the background. But black text on a red background gives a very strange visual effect that makes it hard to read the text. And some people are colorblind, and they might not see the red properly. So why not change it to black? Well, that doesn't really work very well either. So go for contrast. So dark text, light background. The bigger the amount of contrast, the easier it is to read. It's not the only way to do it, but it's one way to do it. Here's a curious thing. We, we're in love with pie charts, uh, but, but actually many years ago this demonstrated that most data, most data is easier to interpret in a bar chart. But doctors love to put pie chart parts up because pie charts are fun to make and fun to look at. But what do you want to tell? What's the story here? So I would challenge you to tell the difference between groups two and group three in this pie chart. It's really not easy, certainly to tell which is bigger, but definitely to tell by how much one is bigger than the other. But if we put that data up as a histogram, it's much easier to see the difference between the groups. So look at the chart that you're producing and work out which type of chart gets your message across more clearly. Now, if you wanted to demonstrate how Shakespeare liked to bump his characters off, and you wanted to make the message clear that he mostly stabbed them, a pie chart's very good. But if you wanted to know how many were baked in a pie, it's not so easy to get that data out of this chart. So a pie chart is appropriate if the message can be clear from the pie chart. Is a pie chart or a chart always the best way? Well, this again is from one of our leadership trainings talking about heritability in psychiatric disease. One of the great things about teaching PowerPoints, you get to hear all sorts of really interesting talks in different specialties. But I would challenge you to get the message on that slide at first glance, whereas this slide shows you very clearly that there are certain conditions which have a much stronger heritability than others. Sometimes the chart that you want is in a journal. And this is a nice chart, again, about heritability of psychiatric disease. But the problem is it's a bit small. And when you blow it up, you've all had this experience, it becomes fuzzy and pixelate because it's a low resolution image. If you look at the bottom, you can see the figure for identical twins, 48%. So just remember that one. The answer here is to remake the chart. It's a bit of work, but you have to do it to get that message across. But I've left out identical twins because that's a really big message from this slide. So give it a slide of its own. The heritability in schizophrenia and identical twins is nearly 50%. That's a big take home message on this presentation. What do we do with something like this? So this is a talk from a fourth year medical student <coughs> on norovirus reports. And I use this to try and draw an audience in. And
and ask them to tell me what they would do with it. And very quickly, they tell me there are two titles, that there's some symptoms at the bottom that really shouldn't be there, and there are a number of years for which there, there's data, but no data. So how do you get that into your PowerPoint presentation? And even if you get rid of all that extra stuff, it's now starting to pixelate and become blurred. So there's a trick. Put it into your presentation and make it semi-transparent, and then cheat. So we draw a line over both of the axes. We we'll use the PowerPoint draw tool and draw over the graph itself. And this is just freehand drawing in PowerPoint. Do that for both data sets. Then add in some numbers for the axes and delete the original chart. And now you have a nice clean version of the previous chart. And it gets away from that horrible blurry pixelated chart. But ask yourself at this stage, what's my message here? What am I trying to say? So if you're trying to say that the data for 2009 showed that there was a greater epidemic of norovirus than 2010, that's fine. But if you're trying to show that norovirus is a seasonal disease, it's better to put the seasons in than the week of the year, because who remembers what week 25 is? So think about the message that is in your slide and make that clear in the slide. So how do you choose which chart type? It's very simple, as we all do. You go to Professor Google and you type in the words, which chart should I use? And you look at Google Images, and up comes this wonderful graphic, which you can print off and put on your study wall. You won't be able to read it very well, because it's about A4 size, but it takes you through the decision-making for the correct chart. It may not be a chart. It may be an infographic. And sometimes the infographics get the information across much more quickly to your audience than a chart. Now, I can't have a presentation on PowerPoint without talking about talking about the A word. So a lot of people at presentation skills courses ask me, when should you animate text? And, and so in the same way as we have a, a, an infographic that takes you through decision making in which chart to use, I have an infographic that takes you through decision making for when you should animate text. And you're welcome to print this one off as well if you want. Uh, it's relatively <laughs> simple. <laughs> but text should be fixed on the slide. And there's very little benefit in animating text. But there is benefit sometimes in animating a text box which is different. So here is the life cycle of the salmon. And as you can see, a small proportion of salmon hatch, the rest break down and become river scum. And a very small proportion of juvenile salmon actually make it out into the wild. So it's a relatively simple two-part animation to tell the story. Now I confess I stole this from somebody else. Um, what about the life cycle of a child star? It's much more complicated. So about 10% are the Kylies of this world about 20% the Stormy Daniels of this world. <laughs> and uh, the remainder, they, they do meet up and rehab briefly. Uh, some of them you can find on daytime TV. Many of them down your local Tesco. Uh, and about 20% are politicians, which obviously takes you back to river scum. So the point of this is if you put that flow diagram up at the start complete, people would be trying to work their way around it. And similarly, if you put your consort diagram up at the start, you can't easily tell the story at a pace that you can control. So you can work your way through your consort diagram and tell the story of your trial and how it worked out. And there's a lot of controversy about whether withholding that data annoys the audience. As long as it's appropriate, you can do it that way. It's up to you to decide, does it work for that presentation and that audience? So where do you get all these ideas? And the answer is really simple. You steal them. And there is nothing original in design or art these days. Everything has been stolen from somewhere else. So what you do is look around you, and you look for things that inspire you. And if you see a nice slide, a nice book, a nice poster, take a picture of it, keep it on your phone. I use Evernote, which is a wonderful program for storing ideas. And you can have an ideas book, which many designers do. So I don't know how many of you have an interest in reading a book about loneliness, but the dot on the eye in loneliness, have you spotted where it is? very clever, and if you were giving a talk on loneliness, that would be a great way to do it. Those of you who listen to the great Steve Jobs on, uh, presenting at Apple conferences will recognize the, the value of the faded gray background, but a very clever idea on the ethics of interrogation. Could you use those for inspiration? Well, you can all use PowerPoint and the drawing tool, so you've probably all drawn a line in a box, but if you look at three and four highlighted there, it's a little light bulby, dew droppy thing, and a little thing that looks a bit like a lampshade. And if you can draw a box, you can draw a flow shape. So it's not that difficult for you to line them all up. 
that's what an ARCP interview feels like for many trainees. So you look at the thing that inspires you and break it down into the individual elements and say, well, how could I do that? And actually that process of the, how could I do that is what will inspire you to find answers. And, and there are lots of places online you can go to get help. So then we finish with the third P, the presentation itself. And I can't tell you how to do a presentation easily. You need to look at people who do it well and follow their lead. But you'll know that the only answer is practice. And you'll, you'll fall over a few times, you'll hurt yourself, you'll get bruised and embarrassed. <coughs> but the more you do it, the more you practice it, and the more challenging the audience you present to, the better you'll get at it. Try to be different. Challenge yourself a little bit to stand out from the crowd. Because if you do it the same way that everybody else does it, it's not going to be as engaging for the audience. So sometimes it'll work, and sometimes it won't. Ultimately, I guess people fall into two groups. There are those people who think, I'd really like to try that, and they're likely to succeed. And those who think, it's not for me, I'll get my registrar to do it, and that's fine. <laughs> um, but I would encourage you to give some of these things a go and try and improve your presentations. It's worth it in the end. To get back to the reason I'm here, which is Hugh Dudley, in his who's who entry. Who has a who? <laughs> who's who entry these days? But he, he listed his three interests in retirement as missing peasants, annoying others in search for history. Uh, I'm, I'm not a great shot, so I can't say much about the first. I have a very minor interest in search of history, but I greatly enjoy annoying other people. I hope I haven't annoyed the people who are going to speak later today. <laughs> but it is a great pleasure and privilege to be asked to give the 2018 UW Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much indeed. simplicity, directness, and so on and so forth. Are there any questions about this? Uh, the one thing that I was interested in, Terry, was uh, I was driving on the motorway a few months ago, just turned it on, I was halfway through a radio program, and the gist of it was that many institutions, particularly business schools and companies, were dropping PowerPoint. And this was, I think, for two reasons. It's partly the Marshall McEwen thing, you know, the medium is the message. And there was a, such glossy slides and so many promotions, the message was being lost. And the other reason was, as you said at the beginning, the complexity, particularly you find in management, the slides are put up are impossible to read, they're complex, they're dense. Now, are we going too far with PowerPoint? I mean, have we lost, is the medium become the message? Possibly, but I think we can pull back from that. So th there's a little pamphlet we're, we're creating by Capital Edward Park, which is quoted in the New York Times, uh, basically on the heading of PowerPoint makes you dumb. And, and his argument was that by putting everything you needed to say on your presentation, you were no longer a good speaker. And I think that's true. And, and he, he has a lot to say about the disasters that have occurred because of bad PowerPoint presentations. But I think the answer there is not dumb PowerPoint, the answer is to do PowerPoint better or presenting better. There are other presentation uh, software uh, ideas out there that are equally good. I think we haven't taught presentation skills well enough, and that's the problem. I don't think it's PowerPoint's fault, I think it's our fault. Any questions? Yes, Ronald. What's your view on handouts? Because you mentioned that you should generally when you're going to give handouts, have that kind of principle of when you present. Because some, some of the feedback I've had previously is that there's no handouts that's been given, and often the people who get those recordings should be handouts. Yeah, okay. So, well, I, I'm going to. I'm going to be a politician here and answer your question and then answer a slightly different question as well. Um, so you, you cannot produce an effective PowerPoint presentation that's engaging that is also a useful handout. However, you can produce a PowerPoint presentation with a handout in the notes section. So if you want a presentation and a handout, put what you want the audience to read into the notes section so that they can then read it. But actually it's much easier just to produce a handout in Word. So you could provide short notes for the students and do the presentation separately, and, and that works well. Um, the second question I was going to answer that you didn't ask is why do students do that? Why do they want a, a, the PowerPoint presentation with a handout of it? And, and the reason is that universities very often tell them that's what they should do the other way around. We want you to prepare a presentation on this subject and hand it in for marking, 
and they put everything in the presentation. So universities don't understand the use of the notes part of PowerPoint, and they should be encouraged to hand in the PowerPoint notes and not the PowerPoint presentation. Um, question. Um, my question really is, um, is there ever a place for comic sans? I remember <laughs> watching, uh, I remember watching uh, the team at the Hadron Collider present the, the discovery of the Higgs boson, and they did the entire presentation to the world in comic sans. So I, so, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I wrote a whole chapter on typography. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know nothing at all yeah. about it at the start. So, Comic Sans yeah. is great if you're a Sunday school teacher or, or even because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, that's what it's designed for. So, uh, the typeface that you choose is really important um, for, for two reasons. First of all, it has to be professional, uh, so it should look smart for most part. So, Comic Sans for Sunday school or chalkboard for Sunday school would be great. Comic Sans not for professional presentations. But secondly, it needs to be legible. So there are fonts that are more legible than others, and generally those are the ones you see in the more modern version of PowerPoint, so Tahoma, Verdana, Arial, etc. And then thirdly, it, if you're going to show your presentation on another computer, it must be universally available. It must be what's called a safe font. Now, PowerPoint for Word embeds the fonts in the presentation, but only if you, PowerPoint for, for uh, Windows, embeds the fonts in the presentation, but only if you tell it to do it. So if you use a funny font that's on your computer because you've got a video game or something, and then put that in the presentation, it may not be where you go and you may lose that font. So that's why your bullet points go all funny. The Mac version doesn't embed the, the fonts in the presentation, so you lose it anyway. So you've got to be very careful about your choice of fonts and stick to the safest ones. because teaching the teachers what you have to do every three years. So the dean quite rightly thought, well, we can't teach them the same old stuff every three years, so let's take teaching the presentation skills and give them some educational stuff as well. Uh, I, I think that we should be teaching throughout the, the, the course. I think we should be teaching them early little bits about presentation skills, but, but not everything. Um, we do it for the core training at that stage of our boot camp, and we sit quite nicely at that level. Um, but it, it's not well taught within the university. said, and once a patient said to me, uh, um, you work for the BBC, and I said, what do you mean? She said, well, first of all, you gave me the headline of all the news, then you gave me the news, and then you gave me the summary of the news, because as you know, the more you tell the patient, the more they'll mm -hmm. talk. Is this the same for PowerPoint presentation? I suppose it depends on what you're talking about. Well, yeah, I think you do. I mean, there is an educational theory that says you should tell them what the news is when you tell them, tell them it, and then tell them again. Yeah. And, and I think whether you stick to that traditional style or whether you just stick to your learning points. So four or five messages to take over. That's all, four or five messages. And you don't overburden, especially students, with too much information. And, and so they go away and they remember the key points of your course. It's not to see ever really. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. It's a good question, and I, I think when when um, when I've been at conferences that are mainly industry-based rather than medical-based, that's the challenge to try and get across to designers outside of medicine that, that the scientific community have a very specific need, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to put your hypothesis up on screen, but try to do it in a way that if you have to read it, it's so short that you're doing it at the same rate as the audience, or really difficult thing to do, stop and let them read it. Now, that's very challenging to say, here is my hypothesis, and you can read it. But 
better to, to have it sufficiently short that you can read it at the same rate as the audience.